Well, should we kind of jump into it? And I think we're ready. I don't know if this one necessarily needs a, a disclaimer, but yeah. I, think we're, I think we're good on this one. Okay. Writing well, the legal descriptions should be your own flavor until you get it to in front of the reviewer who wants to put their own flavor on it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but no, I think this one, uh, this will be a fun conversation. Like we talked about kind of coming up when we went through evidence and procedures, a lot of things kind of correlated back to basically errors in legal descriptions, right? And so, uh, and or the writing styles and different things. And so um, these two kind of fit well together. Um, kind of piecing together quite well. So I think so. I think we'll have good discussion off of this one too, because yeah. where legal descriptions fits in this box, there's local flavors and you know personal flavors of how how do I write it? And I, so I think I hope that we get more discussion. You know, maybe even heated on a couple of the chapters here of yeah what people's preferences are and. We'll skip the uh, intro, and uh, I have a unsolicited copy, <laughs> a PDF copy of this that uh, I was able to find, so I saved that down. It was uh, provided to me, but we'll use it uh, from a share screen, share screen standpoint. Obviously, uh, the objective is everybody should have the copy of the book because they're reading it uh, already. So, well, chapter one. Yeah, well, actually, Trent, I'm going to have you go back to the intro. There was a couple of things I absolutely I highlighted in there, and I, I figure we can just kind of use this one. Perfect. Certainly, we're going to get into chapter one, or that's my hope today is to get through through it or through most of it. But yeah. my, my thought was to spend a little bit of time talking about legal descriptions, talking about the purpose of the book here, and and maybe even just having some discussions about some weird ones. I actually have a couple that I'm going to throw up on the screen and maybe share too as we kind of jump into this is set some set the tone for the for the book here. Um, and certainly let's let's just kind of set the tone for Wisdom Wednesdays. I think about everyone on here I've seen the names before so you guys are familiar with it. But uh, you know the intent of this is is I don't plan on being a teacher though I end up speaking most of the time. The hope is as you guys read it we have a discussion it is a round table discussion it, it's come with your questions come with your complaints about the book um, your your own professional experiences that can add to it uh, you know we do have some very experienced people on here and we've got i, I know a couple of guys that are working to get licensed right now one of them's on vacation today so he's not going to be here but he plans on hitting the rest of them. He, he found Wisdom Wednesdays over the summer and and went through it and reached out to me. So he's he's going to be jumping on on the next weeks here. So certainly I want to get that discussion going. And uh, uh, maybe to start that discussion here, just the, the first part of, of this introduction, uh, the, the last half of that first sentence, um, you know, the best attitude that should prevail towards one of the more important aspects of modern um, serving is is the purpose of this book. Um, Why well, I selected the title "Writing Legal Descriptions." That is that is in essence everything we talked about in in uh, boundary evidence and procedures for boundary location. We looked at that legal description. We tried to put it on the ground. We found the best evidence of it. But as current surveyors the best thing we can do when we write legal descriptions is to provide all that evidence provide all that intent um, and so with that i want to show and talk about an interesting experience i had last week without spilling the beans too much um, i'm going to pull up can i share trent yes sir i'm going to pull up a county gis map here and I had a really neat experience happen. Can you guys see that all right? It's a uh, try and it says your share. There it goes. It, it's loaded now. There we go. So this is out west, west of the Great Salt Lake, um, the northwest corner of the state. 
kind of the salt flats area. Let me zoom out just a little bit more so you can see where we're at here. This is the county. This is the Great Salt Lake. This is the, one of the largest counties in the state. Salt Lake City sits kind of right in here. And uh, I got a call about a week and a half ago from a podcaster that was looking at a land issue from the early 2000s here in Utah, something I was unfamiliar with. Um, some land had been sold on eBay um, around 2004, bunch of parcels in this section here, section 11, was split up, as you can see, into a lot of really small pieces. And he was calling to find out about legal descriptions and how they're written. And out here, there's no roads even. So if there is a parcel, how do you even get out there? How do you know where it is? And he actually came into the office, him and the owner, one of the parcels here. And we spent about two hours talking about legal descriptions. and. Um, I think we're actually going to get them to come to our fall forum in November that Utah Council of Land Surveyors puts on. So that's about the time they'll release the podcast. They're going to talk about some of what they found. They went and talked to the county recorder. But as far as legal descriptions go, I thought this was a pretty interesting one. So I was going to come pull up some of these descriptions. They're aliquot part descriptions, and I'm kind of having fun digging into the history of it. A lot of these have gone to tax sale, and the county is one of the uh, smaller and larger in size, but smaller counties. So their 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 map isn't all that great of their their interface. Um, but if you can see right here, I don't know how well that you can see, but it's the west half of the north two fifths of the southeast quarter of the northwest quarter of the northwest quarter of the northwest quarter and the east half of of the north or the east two fifths the southwest quarter the northwest quarter the northwest quarter of the northwest quarter of section 11 township 8 north range 14 west salt lake basin meridian and everything and we go back to that that map there everything is written in that way. It's all aliquot parts. And so from a survey standpoint, it's, it's quite fascinating because, I mean, that's what we always want, aliquot parts. They're, they're fairly simple to break down and um, survey procedures, depending on what section you're in, you, you kind of know how to, how to locate that. Um, gets challenging because the only survey that was done was the original 1904 survey. And I don't think there's any section corners to actually break this section down with. Um, but I thought I'd throw that out as just kind of a, as we start talking about legal descriptions, what do you guys think? There's an interesting legal description for you. Aha, uh -huh. I got a comment. Yeah, go for it, Jerry. Okay, sorry on this. Uh, there are no fifths in the, in the PLSS. There are quarters and their halves and stuff. So the question is, are these aliquot parts or are these quasi meets and bounds descriptions that are a mixture of sequential conveyances of simultaneous conveyances? In which case, you do have, in fact, junior and senior rights between those adjacent parcels, which are aliquot parts you would not. Fair point. I like it. What, what section is this? All so these section 11. At least it's interior. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I would, my first thing that came to mind is it took longer to determine the, the fifths part of the legal description than just maybe a true uh, meets and bounds. What, yep. what, was the, what was the date on the original? Do you know? Was so these these were split off best I can tell and I was, I'm starting to dig into this because I, I met with him but I met very unprepared he just kind of dropped it on me and came in but uh, these the splits happened somewhere around 2004 someone bought this I don't know when he bought it oh, done the title the search <laughs> um, but he started selling them on eBay in 2004 and I think for about a year and a half to two years, he was slowly selling some of these off and the county found out and put a, a quick cease and desist to it because they were illegal subdivisions. Um, he was using eBay as his realty conveyance, huh? Yep. Well, there's a novel approach. I wonder if I could do that on Amazon too. Yeah. 
Yeah, there you go. Um, you know, from the from the county standpoint, yeah, you're looking at Amazon uh, Prime real estate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the county concern. One of the concerns they have is any of these interior. There's no easements that went with them, so there is an immediate trespass to get into your your parcel. Um, so that was a really interesting one. I'm I'm excited to see kind of what comes of this, and maybe have some more to report as as this goes on. I do some more research and see how this podcast goes. But I thought that was a great kind of starting point of, of as we look at legal descriptions, how important they are and what they what they mean to the surveyor. But more importantly, what do they mean to the landowner? Because the, the guy that bought this that I talked to bought it in 2005, uh, had just graduated college. And his idea was he was looking at some parcels in Utah and a parcel in Texas and he had the uh, quote unquote American dream. He wanted to get a piece of the West, right? Some rural rugged out there piece and he bought four half acre parcels for $600 in 2004 and then had no clue what he bought, no clue where it was. And uh, more interesting than that is he did make an attempt with GPS at the time handheld to go locate his land and is about a three quarters of a mile to the northwest in a different section in land owned by the railroad. Well, that's no different than looking in the back of Popular Mechanics or some magazine like that and seeing that you can buy a square foot of Wyoming land for X number of dollars to say that you're a Wyoming landowner, or that you can buy a square inch of land in Scotland and be an earl because yep. you can buy a square inch of land there also. I'm still waiting for my parcel on Mars when that one gets split out more and they <laughs> we're gonna have lay that we're gonna have lay that out for you. <laughs> yeah, I've got my Mars poster behind me here. Surveyors wanted, so we'll find somebody. Didn't a Quaker Oats sell land many years ago off the back of their uh, oatmeal containers? Yeah, that, that sounds familiar. Yeah, that's been that's been a novelty type of thing for years. Yeah. Of course, if you quick claim it, that, that's one thing. If you quick claim it, you know, there's there's no big deal. Was this guy quick claiming these parcels or was it? No, it was a warranty deed. <laughs> a warranty deed, all right. <clears throat> a, a non a non-insured, non, you know, but it was a warranty deed because that's what the guy was selling on eBay. So um so continue on back over to the book here. The reason I bring this up is is further down this introduction on paragraph three. Um, he says the concept of land surveying as an art is subtly covered throughout the text and and I want to make a distinction between the science of land surveying that I believe we talked about with evidence procedures, but the writing of legal descriptions really is to me an artistic venture uh, you're, you are painting a picture with words of what they own and where that is on the ground. Um, and so I just, those are a couple of things that I saw in the introduction that I thought I'd, I'd point out real fast. Um, and then in the preface, uh, in the third paragraph, he talks about the word legal, the last sentence there, the adjunct of the word legal pertains to the fact that the description must be able to withstand attack under law. Um, and so I throw that out to the group. You know, I've, I've always wondered that. I had read Walls before, but rereading it here kind of kind of puts that back on, on me as a professional land surveyor. Sometimes I, I wondered if when I send out a description, say for an easement or, you know, a preliminary description for something, you know, I, I left off the word legal description sometimes because I wanted to make some some statement that this is preliminary or this isn't the final or this isn't a deed description right this is just a i'm describing something that's out there um but but you know anything we do or any of those even a, an easement description must be able to withstand attack under the law we we've, we've gone around with the uh the attorneys in wisconsin here a number of times saying that we can't 
Surveyors can't write legal descriptions because you're not lawyers. You can write a property description, but you can't write a legal description. So we, we kind of been going back and forth on that terminology type of thing, so. Any other states having that debate or discussion? I'm not aware of any in my kind of where I focus. Okay, well, that's all I had in the in the first parts of it. So let's go ahead and and, and jump in then um, to chapter one here. And certainly, guys, please feel free to jump in and talk as we as we go through here. Trent, um, I have a question about Mr. Waddles himself. Nowhere in his preface or the introduction does it say he said he was involved in the title or whatever, but you see Ira Alexander was the assistant chief deputy, but what was or who is Mr. Waddles? Can someone tell me that? I did not do my history work enough to maybe give a proper um, biography of him. Uh, yeah, it doesn't even it, he doesn't even introduce himself. He tells him about what you know this whatever. He doesn't really say what his titles were. Was he a land surveyor? Was he just a title guy? What was he? Anyone at better able land answer that? Any of our 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 teachers are more experienced, or our California guys would be more um, familiar. I'm just I'm just looking it up. He has a Wikipedia page. Oh, it, it says he was a an early businessman, banker, and civic leader in. Omaha, Nebraska, who became responsible for bankrolling much of early Hollywood. <laughs> and I guess he lived from 1855 to 1932. So sort of the turn of the century. Um, but let's see. Yeah, God, be careful because there are a couple of waddles. Yeah, well, this doesn't is, sound like that one. This is Gurdon. He was a lawyer, Gurdon, Gurdon Wallace Waddles. And um, let's see, he was a, a lawyer. He was involved with the Trans-Mississippi and International Exposition. What was his middle this, initial? Oh, this um, one's W. Wallace. Ours is oh, this H. Is, this is oh, H. OK. Oh, good. Yeah. I was, I was ready to say, he works out in Sacramento. Uh, he's a yeah, reasonable guy. <laughs> OK. The other one. Hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to pull one up here too while you guys are reading that. But uh, anyway, I'll put that on homework, and maybe everyone else can do this homework. Let's see if we can't find a little bit more information. I just kind of was reading some of the the highlights that the introduction um, that Ira had put in here um, about his qualifications. Like you said, they are, you know, fairly veiled in there. Um, Connie, uh, Connie threw it in the chat that he was an Orange County, San Diego guy, a private surveyor. So he come. He was around that era with uh, Brown and everybody in kind of that same general area. Mm -hmm. Okay. It'd be interesting to see how, how or if there was interaction with Brown and some of those other guys and stuff, if that was the same era and everything, those that would know. So we'll have to do some research for that for sure. Um. So jump chapter one then. Any other that was a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, any other questions, comments, anything from chapter one that you guys want to throw out there? Uh, questions, uh, complaints that we can use as our talking points before jumping too far into it. Okay, we'll keep we'll keep going here. Um, in my discussion with with this podcast or uh, this chapter, really kind of I leaned on this chapter quite a bit because I was studying it, reading it, and and just even this first paragraph where he talks about the ancient transfer of property. You know, as we talked about how he bought it off of eBay and and what some of these uh, you know a warranty deed or quick claim deed or how do you buy property and how do you do it today versus how he did it and how do they do it anciently? I mean, this, this hit it right, right on here. Centuries ago, the transfer property was accomplished by the seller and buyer 
walking the property around the perimeter of the land and observing the monuments at each corner, known in those days as bounds, or if a monument was not there, they would set one. You know, we talked about even grabbing the, the, the stone and, and passing it through. And so it, it kind of hit. I'm, I'm glad we were studying this right here because it was, it was fresh in my mind as I explained to him how that, that transfer happened uh, anciently and how it, it's reflected today in, in what we do. Um, so then similar customs, I mean, I'm just going to read a hit, couple of these, but a similar custom was used out west under the Spanish and Mexican rule. A subject would present to the governor his diseño or map and petition, expediente, representing his request for an allotment of land. Um, you know, we look at back in, in Ohio, uh, we've got the, the military lands. We talked a little bit about those at the end of the, the, the book last time. You know, those were, were given to those that had served, and there's there's certain areas that were set aside for that. Um, you know, and, and then as, as the United States grew, then we have all these instructions for the public lands. And, and he lists quite a few of these. Uh, when I was out in, in Wisconsin, Iowa, has a pretty cool package of books. Um, they've actually recreated a lot of the old instructions that were pertinent to Iowa, and so you can get those on their state website. Uh, Iowa had a couple of different eras as they moved west through there where those instructions were updated, and so they have those specific updates to those areas. Certainly surveyors in each of our states know the history, we know the names of some of the surveyors that did a good job or didn't do a good job, and, and some of the specific requirements that were set out then. Do um, you guys know of any of, of any of the specific or unique requirements to your areas or states? Okay. We're, where this is the first chapter, we're, we're back into it here, but I'd love to hear from you guys and get some more discussion going as we get into this. Brent, let, let me, I had it muted. I was going to pick up mute. I'm in California, and when California was first founded, we came under the manual of 1851 out of Oregon. And then in 1855, they came out with the public, the manual for the, for the United States. Now, in the Oregon Manual, anything south of the Columbia River, the when you came to a a uh, line, a correction line, a standard parallel, you had standard corners and closing corners. And in the Oregon Manual, the standard corners were the corners coming up from the south, going north, and these closing corners were the ones from the north going south. And then in the 1855 manual, they flipped it. They made them the opposite. Closing corners were coming up from the south going north and from the standard corners would be from the uh, north going south. And what it causes, you know, a lot of people get on these standard parallels and won't, re won't go back to the original government plat to see which one are standards and which one are closing corners. And it uh, it can make a mess real fast in understanding it. Absolutely. Do you mind talking about maybe for some of our young guys, I and mean, we talk about section corners quite a bit. We understand a section if we're, we're working locally, but some of those standard parallels or those corrections, uh, Tim or someone else, throw out of the question out there, talk about how those work and, and why they're there and why those are so important. Well, as the, as the earth converges, they have to do a correction because the lines would continue just to go straight up, you know, and keep this plane survey going. So they, they would correct up here every 24 miles and th they would do their corrections. And of course, sections would slide over. So then they would run up north for another 24 miles. In my county, I deal with the sixth standard, seventh standard, eighth standard parallel. 
And I also deal with Mount Diablo out of California. And I deal with San Bernardino Basin Meridian. Both of them are Basin Meridians. And um, the eight standard parallels where the uh, San Bernardino meets the uh, Mount Diablo. And that's unique in itself. Um, you know, we have problems on it constantly, it seems. Um, you know, they're always trying to, you know, prove who's correct down there on the line in Kern County, that is. Um, they've been out there quite a bit over the years. But it's, you got to know where you're at, you know, instead yeah, of jumping, yeah. jumping on a, a, if you're on a closing corner, you've got to move it up to the standard corner. So you got to go out and get more corners so you can, you know, square up the section. Yeah, I was actually, as a young surveyor, first introduced to that in North Dakota, you know, sent out there to survey and hadn't, hadn't yet needed to deal with, with, with a standard parallel. And, you know, I, I'm hitting them, you know, the, the shifts there and the roads were so tight to section corners, everything was right on there. You know, it's the road jogs to follow because they're all section line roads, right? So you hit that parallel and you come over to the road and come back up and there's section corners on both and, and understanding, understanding that was, that was a new learning experience to me because I was just kind of thrown into it. I'm like, why do I have two section corners right here next to each other? What the, uh, the, the first one, the first surveyor general really recognized the fact that you have to deal with this in a mathematical fashion was Jared Mansfield back in 1803 but it was actually Tiffin in 1815 instructions who introduced the concept of the correction line, but he left it to the discretion of the surveyors out in the field as to how often to place it. The, and over time that had changed, uh, it, it got to be uh, in multiples of six miles, obviously. In Wisconsin, for example, our standard parallels are every 60 miles, except for the very last one which they got a special dispensation from the surveyor general to place it at 24 miles because at 60 miles would have been Lake Superior. So, but we don't have any guide meridians. They didn't come in until after Wisconsin was uh, surveyed. So guide meridians or auxiliary meridians as they were initially called, didn't come in until uh, about the 18, Trying to look at my my history here, <laughs> eighteen eighty one or so, uh, those came in. So there there was that that development right in the eighteen forties to eighteen eighties. We saw a big evolutionary change in the correction lines and where co uh, closing corners went, because they went from being on the north side of every township boundary to just on the correction lines themselves. And we also in Wisconsin have them on the west side of the township boundaries on the southern part of the state. So it, yeah, it, it, you gotta look at the history uh, to understand why those roads are, you know. And I love to talk to students is why are you driving north on the road and you have to take a sudden left and a sudden right? Congratulations, you just crossed a correction line, you know. Absolutely. Uh, do we have any, sometimes we've had some guys from Texas. Do we have any Texas guys in here today? It looks like Trent jumped off for a second or turned off his camera, but on the next page, it continues on with the discussion of some of, some of the other areas in which these, these, these different methods of measuring or laying out the land originally happened. So, uh, it shows the, the picture there on the right hand side of what is the public domain of the PLSS system. And we have our meets and bounds of the colonial system there. And then we've got Texas. And I was going to pull in here. You guys ever used EarthPoint? It's a, it's a really great resource here. Um, share this one. Yeah, EarthPoint is used on every time I do research. Yeah, it's a great jumping off point, but uh, we did some surveying in Texas and they've got they've got their own system in Texas. And so you can show this on Google Earth. And I thought I'd pull it up here and see if we couldn't see some of their 
it was really interesting being unfamiliar with it to to have to go out there and see it and search it um share my sorry share my my google earth instead here and we can kind of see how they tie to different areas if i can pull in i was in dallas when i did it texas is so big here let's go into dallas So they kind of have these regions, if this will pull up here for us where we're talking. You can kind of see this orange, orange area here and this one here, different shapes. And so a lot of the deeds when we were out there were tying to, you know, these had designations and everything tied to one of these, these corners, but they were all kind of random where we were serving that you know for me they had no rhyme or reason obviously they do there and they date back to some of the the spanish and and mexican areas there but uh yeah i thought that was really fascinating coming from a from a very strictly pls background to come out here and be chasing these these weird shapes you know and and trying to find corners that were marked and generally we were finding those those corners in um if deeds were calling to them. So that was that was really quite fascinating as another way of, of surveying the background of, of how those descriptions were written. Um, so it talks about here in the book, uh, besides the private holdings in colonial states, Kentucky and Tennessee were other areas under private grants within the public domain, which had to be honored and circumvented by surveys of the public lands. Some of these were the Greeley French claim surveys in Michigan, the French grant in Ohio in 1795, a second one in 1798, the Virginia military district in Ohio and others. Um, certainly we've talked about at length here um, through evidence procedures in, in Utah, the Mormon pioneers settled and they had their own lot and block system. Uh, and and they come to kind of get out of the United States to flee religious persecution and, and kind of created their own area here and eventually became a territory and then became a state. And upon statehood, they had to then comply with the PLSS system. So surveyors came in and essentially surveyed on top of what was already established land ownership. And these section corners fell within, you know, homes and backyards and you have this overlap area where, where neither system was ever fully executed. They did half the lot and block and tried to hold on to that and did half the PLSS and tried to enforce that. And then and they both kind of failed, which makes an interesting area to survey when you're in those, those parts. Any other systems that you guys are familiar with or talk about before we move on there? Any other interesting things to talk about? We have a whole, huge volume of donation donation land claims up here in Washington. Mm -hmm. and, and they're kind of the same way. They're, you know, pre pre GLO. So they sit on top of the or, or underlying or on top of either way you want to put it on top of the PLSS system. Are they similar to like like we have in Utah, a lot and block system, or more like Texas, something you know a little bit more unique to the area? What's the setup um, there? They were they were required to be surveyed, and and usually they are done by like meets and bounds. But they predate they're pre pre statehood and pre GLO. Okay, thanks for sharing. I, yeah, I haven't surveyed much in Washington, so I wasn't familiar with that. Yeah. You know, our, our California guys have a bunch of different systems to, to kind of look at and some of the ranchos there and, and things to, to take into account. Um, similar, similar to a Indian allotment or, a, you know, the military, the military allotments or the, which we have up here too. And the, um, um, the mineral surveys, you know, got them all up here. Okay, great. Nope. No, no ranchos though. <laughs> Being in California, you know, we deal with ranchos, and some of the ranchos were put in after the GLO, the GLO surveyors had gone through. 
because the uh, rancho hadn't been approved. And once the rancho was approved and got surveyed in, um, I'm, I don't know if they uh, removed the corners that were inside the rancho, but uh, the rancho gets its property. You, uh, uh, you come up against it and uh, if there's an error. I mean, the rancho gets it. They're, they're prevailing. Can somebody explain to me what a rancho is? I'm an East Coast guy, and I read the first chapter, but I really can't wrap my head around it. A rancho is land that was given prior to California being a state by uh, Mexico, Spanish, uh, Spanish land grants. And they gave them to uh, military people. And you heard uh, Trent earlier talked about a decenio. They'd go out and just draw a map on a piece of paper and say, here it is. And when you look at these decenios, you're going, how in the heck are you going to survey off of this thing? But, uh, you know, they put them in the ground uh, over the years, back in the 1870s, uh, 80s. And they're just big blocks of land. Uh, I know Kern County, I deal with five, five ranchos that I've uh, been surveying in and up against. So, you know, it's, it's a lot, to me, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's interesting, so. Yeah, thank you, Tim, for that background. Oh, you're welcome. Hey, thanks, Sean, for the question. I continue on the book here. Uh, we get into, and this is kind of cool, I actually had this note underlined from the first time I did it, uh, um, top of page 1.6. Note that after government or public land is patented to individuals, it is classified as private land, but is still subject to its outside boundary control based on the rules for the survey of public lands. You know, and so it's probably important to note here about how these lands were laid out and then how we continue to survey them. And there, there's this continual argument um, of the rules we use, uh, the BLM manuals of instructions versus, you know, it's been surveyed, it's been given to public land, so now how do we survey it? It was surveyed this way, but how do you retrace it? Um, and the, the government surveyors versus the private surveyors, you know, I, I've been in many conferences where, where this, this big back and forth of, of what rules apply when, um, and understanding that's critical to be able to retrace that if corners are are lost or or um, need to be reset. Johnny, you muted yourself. Were you gonna jump in there? No, maybe not. It sounded like she was gonna try for a second. So um, I was gonna, I was just gonna add California statehood uh, September 9th, eighteen fifty. So they just uh, just came up on their statehood date a couple of days ago. Okay, cool. Which goes back to Tim saying that the Oregon Manual of 1851, right? So, yeah. Yeah, when California got its statehood, they had to come in fast to, so they could sell the land because of the uh, gold rush of 1849, actually 48, when they started, they found the gold. Uh, but they started coming in and selling. Surveyors would come in and, and they, uh, in the 1850s, of course, 51, they started doing everything they could. And eventually they got quite a bit. And you know, uh, the Benson Syndicate was here. So, you know, he got quite a bit of cash mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of corners missing. But uh, that's another story. <laughs> we uh, we did a little bit of ben Benson uh, Syndicate on um, Mentoring Mondays with uh, Parrish. Good. We hit on that a little bit, so. Early on, though. Early. I'll have to go check that one out. That'd be interesting. So when these, when the original surveyors came through and broke out these townships and sections, they were only breaking it down so far, right? And then the intent was the private surveyor would come in. But there are a few vocabulary words we're, we're probably going to hit uh, repeatedly over time. So public lands being being one, which is those lands which you know were either surveyed through the public land system, the PLSS, um, and then BLM or GLO or those offices or the, the government entity that was 
completing those surveys. Uh, the next one here that we're, we're going to kind of tie to and, and just talked about was was patent. And when I first started sur surveying, you know, going through here, that was another new word. It's, it's one that has some other connotations, you know, with inventions and ideas that get patented. But patent in a land sense is the first grant from the government to a private ownership. And different states have different rules about how you research to patent for title insurance and, and things like that. But that's just another one that we kind of need to hit on and understand as we get, get into this. Uh, transfers of title. Transfer of title from the government to an individual is by the instrument known as patent. The conveyance of private lands between individuals, corporations, or other entities, or to, or to or from city or county entities is accomplished by a document called a deed. And there's quite a bit, quite a number of different deeds. And, and I was actually asked this question I, I, a while back and I wasn't able to answer it. Uh, so you have a quick claim deed. And the way I try and explain that in, in a layman's term to, to clients is quick claim deed is you're, you're quitting any claim you have to a land. You have no guarantee of that. You give it, you know, I'll give, give Jerry any interest I have in this property. I can't guarantee I have, but if I do, it's there and I give it away and I quit any, any, any reference I might have to that. Um, you know, there's, there's not much guarantee or weight behind that. Um, but then you have a, a corporation deed, a warranty deed. And, and the one I couldn't answer here um, is special warranty deed, which I see more and more today. And I, I had to look it up, but uh, thought I'd throw it out to the group. Uh, anyone define the difference between a, a warranty deed and a special warranty deed? No one? Come on, guys. Even our experienced guys. <laughs> okay, so at least in Utah, um, and this is this is just good old Google telling me what it is. So uh, in Utah, special warranty deed allows for the ownership transfer of real estate with the guarantee that no claims have been made during the grantor's period. The grantor will be responsible for any claim made prior to the grantor's ownership. Um, which which is kind of the same as warranty deed and and um, so I, I I didn't come up with a, a really good answer for myself so that's in my to learn to learn folder there there's the, pri the primary difference between those two is that the special warranty deed only warrants against actions or defects in the deed brought about by the grantor no one else okay now, warranty deed warrants all the way back the time immortal from the creation of the parcel of land so it, it basically a, a warranty deed warrants there are no defects in the deed a special warranty deed only warrants that i did not introduce any defects or i did none of them arose as of, as of my actions okay Thanks for clarifying. I guess reading that over again, you know, that arose during the grantor's ownership of the property. I, you know, it was it was in there, but needed to be pointed out to me. So thank you for that. Um, jumping down then to public records, uh, and and this is the one I want to throw again out to the group discussion. Uh, I think. Generally speaking, I, we all deal with kind of the same. There's a, a county or government repository for these records that you can go do research and, and pull them. Um, but anytime that we uh, pass title to something, it needs to be recorded and filed and give. Here's another one of our vocabulary words, constructive notice. Um, and that's just a way of letting people know that it's been done. And there's a number of different ways of doing it, but in the title, Land transfer that the repository for constructive notice is that recorder's office or register of deeds office. Um, so throw it out here to the group. How how is that constructive notice given in your area? Where are those those deeds kept? And what is the process for recording them or filing them or whatever whatever the term might be? Well, in my county, Kern County, the uh, 
the current the current county survey is supposed to be the uh, repository for maps. The recorded maps are done at the recorder's office with a copy given back to the county surveyor's office with all the recording information on it. But we have things called corner records, and they don't have to be recorded. They are deposited with the county surveyor. Supposedly, there are some cities in this county that seems to take them on themselves and somehow they don't get over to the uh, county surveyor's office so the you have several deeds we have swamp and overflow lands and swamp and overflow lands to find the information on that you got to go to sacramento to the, the, uh, uh, the california lands division and you can get there they'll look up the information and send you a copy of that particular survey. And it's just a meets and bounds, like, you know, North 40, West 40, South 40, East 40. And that's your, that's your description. So you have to figure it out from there. You have to, you know, try to trace them back to which one was the first swamp and overflow land done. But uh, that's kind of Kern County and part of California. Okay. Anyone else in another state want to throw out there, Sean, out in the East Coast? How how do you guys kind of give that constructive notice and, and file or record deeds? So um, typically, the uh, like maps are recorded at the town clerk's office for each town. Um, I don't know that if it, it it's mandatory. If you do like a boundary survey, if it has to be recorded, it might be voluntary. Okay. So in, in Utah, the recorder's office is the repository for those deeds. Uh, their job by state statute really is, I get in trouble with, with some of my recorder friends if I say this, but they're a, they're a government filing cabinet. They're just supposed to take it and record it and um, essentially index it. Uh, you know, they, they end up being the keepers of the GIS system and some of the maps as they punch in those deeds. Uh, there's there's some debate going on here locally about what their the extent of their power is because um, some say they should just record a deed despite gaps or overlaps because that's what they're supposed to do and some recorders offices are quasi surveying because they'll retrace the deeds and call out errors and you know try and survey and and if there are remnant pieces that that are end up because of a poorly written description, sometimes they'll even write a remainder description and leave that in the uh, original grantor's names. So that's how we do it. And certainly we talked about uh, in evidence and procedures that we have a surveyor's office where surveys are filed that are not part of the official public record, would not show up in a title search and, and do not actually affect the property in that sense where other states, those surveys get filed along with the deeds and have have some effect or reflection in there. Um, as we've been talking, Jerry, Jerry threw out a comment here in Black's Law Dictionary, there are over 40 types of deeds listed. Uh, Jen, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, good. Um, so I'm in Massachusetts and we have um, uh, most of our records get recorded at, at the Registry of Deeds, which is sort of more or less county-based. Um, some counties have more than one. Um, and we also have a uh, torrent system. So we have land court um, properties that go go through that that are um, registered there. So you get, you get both systems going. Um, and surveys don't have to be recorded. Unless it's land court, then it has to. So Darren's got his hand up. I do have a question for you, Jen, after that, uh, about not filing the servers, not recording them. But uh, uh, Darren, uh, what do you got for us? Um, all legal descriptions, deeds, deeds are, are um, filed with the, we have auditor's offices up here, county auditors, um, and um, they are recorded there. Same with the survey maps are recorded. Um, and we are celebrating um, 
50th anniversary of the Survey Recording Act up here in Washington. Um, 1973, legislature establishes the Survey Recording Act um, mandating that all surveys be recorded. They're recorded at the county level and then they are stored at a central repository, the Public Land Survey Office, which is uh, um, underneath the Department of Natural Resources that um, I happen to work for. <laughs> Okay, great. Thanks for sharing. Um, Jan, are those that, that don't have a, a, a requirement to file the survey or, or you know you have a couple different places to do it, how does survey research look for you guys if you've got to go to three or four different, and maybe I'm answering the, the question in my question, but you're going to three or four different places to find all the possible locations of information you need? Um, well, there's usually a clue if you need to go to a, the land court records, um, and you know it'll it'll say that there's recorded land or something or registered land, um, and it it doesn't have a booking page. It'll have like a certificate number listed in the deed, so then you know that you have to go look there. But if you're just sort of looking for, um, you know, a budding parcels, more, more information other than in your title that you've been searching. Um, that's, it's good to check both places, but um, it's more common in certain parts of the state. So generally, if the, it's an expensive process to register the land. So um, it's really, if you're closer to Boston or, or some of the more um, expensive areas. It's more common. Um, but you do find it in the western part of the state too sometimes. And if you're um, in the field, it's a different monument. So it has its own thing with a disc on it usually that says um, that it's registered. Is so that like a, a government monument then or it's just a specific call out that the surveyor should set? Um, well, it's been a while since I've seen one, but it's 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 a specific monument. Yeah, it's usually like a, a concrete with a disc on it or something like that. Okay, great. Sean, what do you got for us up there? Yeah, so uh, most of the private maps that are uh, you know published in Connecticut, like we'll use Hartford for an example. You know, you would find anything uh, produced in that in that city to be in the city town hall in their uh, land records office, um, highway department maps, that's through the state of Connecticut, like the Department of uh, Transportation. Um, so it's it's kind of nice where you can find everything within the town or city hall. Okay, thanks, Jerry, your hands up and- Yeah, it, 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 kind of, it depends on what you're researching. If you're just researching the chain of title, that's one thing, but if you're researching the boundaries and surveys and stuff that occurred before that, then you've got all sorts of different places to go to. You normally don't research a chain of title by going to a utility company, pulling up utility records, but you would go say in our, in our case to the county surveyor's office, because anytime somebody performs a property survey or resurvey, whether that gets used for conveyance or not, that's filed with the county surveyor's office. Now that's not, registered or recorded like it is at the recorder of deeds office. The constructive notice means that anyone that has a legitimate reason to know can find that information as a matter of law without having to have it at being an actual notice, being, being actually aware that somebody owns the land. So the whole idea with recording a deed is you put it in a place where it's accessible by the public and it's also protected from ad hoc alterations. You can't, if you find a deed that's got a mistake on it, you can't just go in there and start erasing and making corrections on it. There's a legal process you have to go through because it protects the sanctity of that record. Um, so that, that's what constructive notice is. It puts it in a place where someone who has a need to investigate or find out can locate that. So for instance, if, if I sell my land to you, and you don't record your deed. You don't have to record your deed for it to be a legitimate conveyance in the state of Wisconsin. 
But if someone else, I offer to sell it to someone else, to a third party, if they look in the Register of Deeds office, who are they going to see as the owner of record? Me, because you didn't record the deed. So there was no constructive notice of your purchasing that land. So there's a break in the chain of title at that point. If he records the deed, then he's got a stronger claim to it because he filed his, his deed like he should have to protect his rights in the property. Okay, I like it. Thanks for, for clearing that up and explaining that process there. Uh, Jen, go ahead. Um, so I just wanted to add that you don't have to look in like multiple places just for the title of research. So everything is by county. Um, so if, if you know what town you're in, you know which county to look in and you can find those records. Um, and if it's, uh, if there's property in two separate counties, um, it'll be recorded in both registries and that information will be on the deed. Um, and um, there are places where if you, as you go back, like I'm in Northern Worcester County, and as you go back and in, in, if you go back far enough, it's part of Worcester County's record. So you have to switch registries. So you just have to be aware when all of a sudden the trail ends for no good reason. It's probably, um, you know, a shift like that. Um, yeah. And you said something about um, not recording the surveys. So we don't, I think the idea here is that it's private information, um, the actual survey. So it's private property and it's nobody else's business. <laughs> that's that's what I've been told. I, I might not have to ask someone with more experience um, for like the real reasons for that. Yeah, it's um, like other survey firms don't have to give you, show you their work or anything like that. Um, and, and if it's not recorded, like, you would have to ask your client before you share it with someone else. I, I remember a conference, I think it, it was either a Minnesota or, or an Illinois conference where that discussion kind of happened. It actually got fairly heated about ownership of a, a survey, you know, even if it is filed and then requesting that, you know, <clears throat> in, in Utah, it's, it's it's common practice to share that, uh, you know, even a professional obligation to go request that or go talk to the surveyor if there is a discrepancy or a question between something that you're you're either retracing or butting up against. Um, very rarely have I had any any pushback, but that's that's an interesting thought process perspective because it is, you know, that, that is your work and it is your stamp on there and and even the, the private ownership of not showing what, what's on your land based on how and what you put on that survey is kind of an interesting thought process. So thank you, Jen, for, for explaining that to us. Yeah, um, what we're talking really about here is kind of this, this, uh, this quasi public records part, right? We're kind of getting into that discussion of, of what is just easily accept, accessible, that constructive notice that Jerry gave us to, and anyone can go get it. And, and what is, is quasi-public, what is out there that might be searched for and or not so readily available, um, and where can you go get that stuff? Um, you know, I, I would consider, you know, a, a GIS map as that, that quasi-public. It's not the official record, but it is something as a jumping off point um, that we can certainly use, like an assessor's map or an ownership map that don't, doesn't actually portray the, the true um, essence of ownership as we do our research, but it, it does give me a jumping off point. Um, at least that's one, one, one way I think about it here in Utah and the way I do my research. Uh, you know, that, that, that 10,000 view map and then jumping into the actual public record. Any other questions or discussions about how, how things are filed? Um, what we file quasi-public records? I was going to bring up the fact I worked for the county surveyor's office for five years. And of course, I, you know, I, I love research so and being nosy. So I, I went through all the files that, that the surveyor office had. And it's, you have to know kind of what's in there to say, okay, this is, this is in there because not all of it's, um, uh, if you don't know it's there, how do you ask for it? Um, like take lines, for instance, 
Army Corps of Engineer around a lake where a new dam was put in. Um, if you don't know to ask for the tape maps uh, that, were, that were put out by the Corps of Engineers, you don't know there. We have, uh, our county has quasi maps. They're on linen. No, nobody ever looks at them. I'm probably the only one that goes in and looks at them. I've actually found corners based upon them. Um, we have miscellaneous maps that are not of record, but they filed them at least. So, you know, if you don't know that, and then we have we have researching that's done online, but not everything in the county surveyor's office is online. You know, and I try to tell these the people in the county I live in, go down and look, see what they have, start questioning. Our county has two sets of uh, field book records. We have one, I, I, I know it exists, it's the old field book, it's anything before 1900. And there's all the information you get into the old field book. So then we have a, another uh, field book record that's from 1900 and above. But if you don't know those old records are there, you're, you're missing out. Um, you know, are you doing your client uh, a disservice? That's a good question. I like it. In Utah, the, the, the original field book notes, the GLO surveyors, uh, they're filed locally and online at our local BLM office. You can get on there online and, and get it. When I surveyed in, in North Dakota, the repository for those original field notes was actually uh, the, the North Dakota Water Resources something or other group. I can't remember the exact name now, but you know, you wouldn't think as a surveyor, if you, you went to that state, certainly you, you got to have that local knowledge, but you wouldn't think to go look at some water resources group that they would be the ones holding those original notes. Uh, Trent, what are you, what are you showing us here? <laughs> <laughs> Record of survey. Yeah, that's funny. I was like, I just saw one of the emails come through. I'm like, what is that? So, oh, okay. I, I thought you had, nope. had a, nope. a, a survey to, to talk about records with us on. So. No, no, no. Somebody's comments on there and it opened up under the PDF. Okay. Um, you know, an another one is, is railroad records. Uh, they, I mean, the railroads are more important than the federal government themselves itself and they can do whatever they want. And so finding their deeds or finding their records it can be a challenge in reaching out to the right one and there's certainly groups i know there's been a couple mentoring mondays where, where trent's had guests on to talk about that process which can be daunting in itself depending on what you're looking for but uh, certainly some other some other locations there to find these quasi public uh, records uh, jumping down here the next little bit you know i'd be curious to see what you guys thought uh, certainly this is this book predates GIS and the internet and modern computers and so much of the records we can we can find today. And like Tim said, even though those records are online, sometimes they're not complete. Even going into a, a county courthouse, are they indexed right? You know, are they tied to the right section or, or something like that? That you know, to find find the map you're looking for, the deed you're looking for, but. Even worse online, you know, I found plenty of cases where I knew there was a survey, but I, I couldn't find it online. I'd go to different places to do it, or how do you search for that? So he talks about <clears throat> land data bank systems, land registration systems, um, and throws out, uh, you know, a couple of organizations um, and proposals made to, to do this. So. Uh, Who's, who works in counties that have a fairly robust uh, GIS or, or, or land data system um, that you guys can access and, and get most of your records? And who of you guys still need to go march down to the county and actually, you know, you're kind of forced to go start pulling, pulling the books? Uh, Jen says, the old proprietor, prop Proprietors maps that you inevitably run into during the title search are at the State Historical Society. These maps are the original settlements. Uh, I would love to see some of those out there. Some of those original ones would be really kind of neat. Uh, Lori says, our county GIS is off by quite a bit in our rural county. 
And is that the uh, just the representation of the lines on an aerial or, or the research itself? Sometimes you have to go different places. Um, I think both, but a lot of realtors and a lot of landowners rely on the county GIS the way the footprint looks like on Google Earth, and it cause it causes a lot of a lot of problems here between neighbors. I, I don't I, know if that's common. Oh, it, elsewhere, it, but. it is. I actually got, you know, one of the challenges is this, the hardest thing as a surveyor is to go tell your client that their land isn't yeah. where they thought it was and they're they're paying for a product and and they didn't get the product they expected to get um mm -hmm. and i went quite quite a few rounds to get paid uh uh with a client that had a county record that showed you know a gis line and she even went to the recorder's office and they told her that it's just a record you know some of these have splash screens that pop up and you have to acknowledge that you understand that you know, there's inherent error in this and the survey must be done. But, you know, she fought me for the longest time. And the unfortunate thing for her and the easy thing for me is that on this is we found original corners, right? There was no doubt. And there was no yeah. occupation that didn't disagree with those corners. And it was, it was hillside, no fences, just vegetation. And, you know, but we, we went the rounds and she was pretty unhappy that, you know, that I would, would set a property that didn't, you know, match what this county county line said. You know, she printed all these off and sat there and argued with me. Yeah. I know the, yeah, like that. Has, the, the GIS site has a disclaimer. And of course, who reads the disclaimers? I'm sure a lot of people don't. And you have to agree with it. And it states in there that, you know, the lines are off, you know, that, that uh, don't use it for surveying purposes, just for or, you know something to look at basically um in the same way with our assessor's maps that the our, our assessor's office puts out he says this is not for land surveying um but a lot of people try to use them for that yeah it gets frustrating when you like you say talking to the client you know you start talking about ortho photos to them and the you all know, the now you're you're speaking alien mm -hmm. so it gets crazy with them so you know you got to explain it but it can be done I know, yeah, here's, uh, here's some great examples trent's got up here I mean, that that fence definitely doesn't fit that that line that's there yeah yeah and the, even you know this mapping of down here too right this side light line so um i do know this is a uh, clark county based in las vegas and i know they're they're actually rolling back a little bit on their resolutions and some of their stuff so that uh, you can't zoom in as tight anymore so that you don't, so it'll start to eliminate some of this stuff. So you're, um, they're going to start changing some of the, the viewing angles of it so that you can't sit there and zoom in so tight and then use the data. Right. So. Well, well through some people off, particularly in areas and urban areas, where you have got really dense, small lots and tall buildings was because the orthophotography didn't have all the relief displacement taken out of the buildings. The buildings mm -hmm. were offset and it looked like the buildings were crossing the the lines, the, the lot lines, because it was zero lot line situation. And people I just didn't understood it was the additional processing that was involved to do that was cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. I I have uh, something to add to to that. I was part of um, the Minnesota GIS LIS um, Metro GIS uh, project in the late 90s, early 2000. And one of the major things that most of these counties and anybody that were setting up these systems that they wanted people to be buyer beware. So most of the counties in Minnesota have have a full disclaimer on their website. You, you can't get into their website unless you hit that disclaimer. So they have read it, <laughs> they've been notified, but you know, one of the things is you can't, you can't fix stupid. And so a lot of the times that you have to notify to people is a, that's just a website from a GIS. It's not down to accuracy that is survey grade, you know, but a lot of that has to, you know, be something we teach people, not something 
you know, that that's always known, but that's been around for 20 odd years since they do, started doing these GIS and LIS systems. So. It's, it's, it's going to be a continued fight as we see more and more of these systems pop up in databases and GIS grow to become a bigger monster. I know, you know, when we talked last time that, you know, California, you know, was going after an online system that was claiming to be able to do surveys that weren't licensed and they were doing it through it, you know, a GIS map. And occasionally I still see some of those ads pop up on, on Facebook or online of, hey, get your property surveyed or we can show you your property. And the claims there, you know, you can't do it without the evaluation of the evidence and there's so much more that goes into what's written on that document versus what's on the ground. Um, because someone's drawing that map even, right? Not, not even to talk about the errors between, you know, an image and a, and, and a map, but someone has interpreted some deed and just put lines into a, a program even and, and no evaluation of that. And so there's, there's a lot of things to consider. Um, as we've been talking, um, a couple of comments here. So Sean threw out here that he's had difficulty tracing down railroad maps due to the fact that so many companies have been bought and sold over the years. I'm sure it's uh, back east there where, where those railroads started, you know, a lot more of those have been transferred. I could I could imagine how hard that that is and to know where to get those. Uh, Teresa threw out here um, that the LIS is one of the best to download filed maps, corner records. And, and right of way maps uh, up in Minnesota, the GIS system. And, and Jerry talked about the end user license agreement, the EULA that we all sign every time we, we download a piece of software, but it's 200 pages long. And who's ever actually read that? <laughs> uh, so to, um, yeah, Connie says GIS systems need to be better at describing data accuracy. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so a couple of last, the last two sections here, are coordinates and laws. Um, and it, it's interesting, there, there are some talk here, and, and I've, I've gone out at length at nauseum really about some of the nuances that, that Utah is going through as land developers or cities try and um, assert some control over bearings and distances and deeds. Uh, it, it popped back up just a couple weeks ago. Again, we've got some counties that, you know, there's a historic rotation to everything through the county and all the deeds are tied to that. Um, but it, it was it was thrown back out again at the legislature to require some some rotation of deeds on every transfer of land now, every transfer of title. You know, and, and what are the consequences of that, you know, for the homeowner that might just be selling it, not be doing a survey, right? He's got a deed, he's not changing his land, but that land isn't in, you know, a, a NAD 83 or a state plane coordinate system 2025 or whatever it's going to end up being called, right? Does he then have to go get a survey when he sells his to bring it up to a current thing? Or what about a plat if it's not rotated, you know? And then coordinates, you know, there, there's discussion, a few of the counties or cities up here of requiring coordinates on a plat. But what about coordinates on a deed? Um, so the validity, it says here, the validity, validity of their use in legal descriptions varies across the country. Some states accept them, others only have only established the state plan coordinate system for use. But without giving points so designated the right of legal control, California definitely relegates coordinates to secondary value. Here again, a careful study of the codes and court cases in your area will reveal the status of coordinates in regard to legal descriptions. And they'll, we'll discuss this a bit more, but there's so much that goes into it. You know, what, is it a international foot, US survey foot? What's the basis of bearing? Where do you start your measurement from? You know, I, I've said this before, but I work for a company that does a 5,000, 5,000 local coordinate system on everything we do. And, you know, then we've got to go through and and translate that, uh, you know, sometimes we have to do that to share data, but uh, there's so much inherent risk in that. Um, and, and really, uh, an, an 
a misunderstanding of what surveyors do, particularly again, getting into these Utah cases of requiring a rotation on a deed. Um, and we'll talk about this in the book and he's hinted to it, uh, you know, in the introduction or, the, or in this chapter here about, uh, you know, calling out where what your basis is um, for others to, to understand. And then finally, laws. Besides maps, records, and other miscellany of information, the framework of law, both state and federal, expressed in statutes, and relevant court cases play a predominant part in guiding and controlling such matters as the filing of maps, recording of documents, surveying of land, colonial land boundaries, the public land system, the meaning of legal descriptions, land and water boundaries, monuments, agreement lines, et cetera, et cetera. This uh, fund of information is to be found in a law library and one who aspires to, uh, I'm reading off the page here, uh, write description that carry legal authority as well as the technicalities of applicable surveying practice will find that research time spent in such library is worthwhile and rewarding. Um, and that's the, going to be the hardest part is, is this is a basis here and we have different ways of writing it, commencing at a point, beginning a point, to the point of beginning. Um, you know, we read legal descriptions that your, your tie is distance bearing, and then they go to bearing and distance through, you know, the, the body of it. All these little nuances here are what I hope we really kind of start talking about and having some great discussion. Um, I have on my page, my computer screen's kind of glitchy here. I had one other description that I encountered today, and I'm going to see if it will share for me. Um, and I share this just because I don't know what it is, one, um, but I thought I'd throw it out here as another interesting description. Let's see if it pops up here. Can you guys see that okay? Mm -hmm. On my screen, it's got, I closed my, my internet, but it's still kind of shadowed behind it, so I just want to make sure you guys can see that. Um, so this is a survey I'm doing. It's, it's the Northeast Quarter, the Northeast Quarter, Section 11, Township 11 North, Range 4 West, Salt Lake Basin Meridian, and then the Reserve a right of way. But here's the one I had never encountered. This they then describe the the back half of the property, which is the Southeast Quarter of the Northeast Quarter, a section and it's blank, assuming Section 11 there, um, reserving a 45 foot strip on east side and a 16 and a half foot wide strip, wide right of way on LS side. And I have no clue what LS side is. Um, and then they begin to describe a, an old railroad right of way. So beginning at a point 45 feet west of the southeast quarter, the northeast quarter of section 11. And I assume then we run west 1275 feet to the west line of the east half of said section 11, then north, and then east 1275, more or less to a point directly north of the point of beginning. So really we've gone west, north, and east around, around something. And then, then it says that south 49 and a half feet to the point of beginning, um, known as the old Utah uh, UPPNR uh, right of way. But if you know, we went north uh, 4,900 feet, but then we're only going back south 49 and a half feet. So that, this, is, this is the problem, right? This is why what we do, the art of surveying is so important is there's a lot left to be assumed in here. Go take, ahead, Jerry. Take a, look, take a look. You got 4912 feet, and then go down to your 49 and a half. You've yep. got the same digits, but you're missing some punctuation in there. Yep. That could very well have been something left out by a scrivener. This is a, this obviously a non surveyor was writing this. Ab yeah. Absolutely, but that, that's why yeah. it's so important to either understand how these are or or have have proper written ones. Yeah, it's a forty. It's a forty nine and a half foot right, right away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Jerry. I was just saying, whenever you see the same digits like that used in a different context, you're looking for something that there's a tran transcription error of some sort. And yeah, does it, which, which one makes sense in the context of what is, because what you're looking for is you want to identify an error. You can identify an error, then you apply the error where it occurs. Yep. What, what I don't understand on, on the 
the description. He starts out, you know, two rod, two rod wide road, I believe. Yep. Was okay. Two. And then he goes, then he goes down and he says 16.5 foot wide right away, but that's one rod. Why did he go from two rods, you know, calling out rods, and then he spells out a distance? Why didn't he call that 33 feet for, instead of two rod wide? You know, he's mixing, uh, I guess, to show he's intelligent. Hell, I don't know. <laughs> well, it is. I think it's because it was split up, right? You've got the north half, which is closer to a main highway, and the south half that, you know, really is farther away. So maybe there was intent there that it was a smaller right away through the half because they specifically called out the two areas. Um, but again, I just thought this was, was interesting as we chased it. Yeah, again, like you noted, the 49, 12 feet or the 49 and a half feet um, railroad right of way. And then the 16 and a half foot, you know, as you noted, Tim, but right away on the LS side. And that's the one that I can't seem to figure out what that is. The other I've kind of figured out or at least assigned an error to and been able to figure it out or trace what the old railroad right away was through there. But uh, this is an interesting thing. Huh. The LS side. The lake side. Because because they're using SD for sub, uh, LS could stand for last stated. Would that meet? Would that could that be an abbreviation for something like that? Last stated would be tough because this would be the south side of the property. So yeah. maybe last stated east side, but then that would be the north side. But those yeah. two connect, and there's no right away between yeah. the north and south well, properties. Well, we see, yeah, we see that SD in there as as an abbreviation. You kind of wonder if that's what they did with the LS also. Yep. Yep. Curious. So that's, I just want to bring that out as closing here. We're kind of hitting that, that six, 630 for me time point here. I really appreciate the discussion we've had with This has been great. This is what I was hoping out of it. Um, any other questions, discussion, you know, what are you looking forward to and, uh, and give you guys some time to kind of chat. Looking at the comments here while I was rambling on, Jerry threw a couple of things. That's what made it. Metadata should be used for. I think uh, we'll definitely have to get into a discussion about metadata um, outside of what the book, book addresses. That's kind of a newer term. Uh, put coordinates on your survey today. What will that information mean in the new datum? Uh, redefinitions coming up in a few years. Will the coordinate system you use today even exist in the future? Or how would you rectify the two and, and, and move them over? Another question is, you know, epoch. You know, what epoch are you running on? You know, I, I can put coordinates all day on something, just change the epoch from day to day. You know, and, and uh, you know, am I, I running on 2017? Did I did it get written on 2010 by the government off of a, a control point? Um, you don't see that uh, often, so you got to you know figure, you know what when did they put the coordinates on it? So you're always going to have something you're not going to be able to figure out when they start putting coordinates on it. And does the coordinates hold or do the distances hold? Uh I, I, the distance on the ground is the distance on the ground, regardless of the datum, the epoch, or whatever. Yep. Yep. Looking, uh, I don't know how far you've gotten ahead, uh, Trent, but yeah. trying to think of almost like um, chapter for chapter two would be support information um, in a couple of weeks. But then chapter three, description fundamentals, that one. That one could almost be broken in maybe into a couple. I, I think so. I, I think some of this, the support, we talked a lot about this, but the, you know, I think next week's may end up being a, a little shorter discussion. So we, we maybe throw the challenge out there is to get two and three red because we may end up getting into three next time. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I'd love it if we threw out this challenge here as, as every week we come, maybe we can look at some um, in our, our, we call it Foresights, our UCLS magazine, uh, we sometimes have, we call it Dastardly Deeds. You know, our, our publication committee will throw some, some tough deeds out there. So I'm going to throw a couple of challenges out here as we discuss, discuss these is, uh, come with a, come with your dastardly deed. Like, like I had this last one here and let's throw some up and critique them and just kind of have fun with it. Um, 
let's let's continue the discussion. But but I, I think like trans like you said, uh, uh, three could be broken up. But I think chapter two could be a, a rather quick one. So so maybe try and get through both chapters, or at least half of the first part of a uh, three, it, it, in case we need it uh, to, to fill up the time and see how it oh, goes. Hell, it took us an hour and a half to get through ten pages tonight. <laughs> I, that's right. That's why I was kind of laughing. And then you go on to chapter four, and that's I mean, there's basically forty four subsections in that thing of determination of what controls, and so that could be. I mean, whew, it's gonna be. I, I like. I like. I know this one's going to get controversial. I, I think people have opinions on this. I think procedures is. You know the the last book was fairly standard information, but um, I, I think we're getting some good discussion as we get into some of these. I'm excited for it. Yeah, and I think uh, it'll grow as as normal. I mean, we ended up with uh, almost 250 people that eventually signed in on evidence. So um, obviously, we had 30 plus sign up for tonight, and you know, 15 or 16 is what we got on most. But yeah, Sean, looking forward to chapter four. Yeah, that one's gonna that one's gonna be a bear. <laughs> it, it is. Well, I'm excited for it. I appreciate you guys. This has been great. Two weeks. Two weeks. Let's All do right. it. All right. Love Have it. A great one, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Trent. Guys. See you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.